you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, we covered the first eight verses last week, and I want to remind you that if you missed that, uh, you can go online and you can see that. Uh, you know, we live stream, but we also uh, put it online, uh, usually by Monday afternoon, that is available for you uh, so that you can catch up and uh, keep going with us. Today I want to talk to you about John's vision, about John's vision, and uh, let me give you the outline if you have your bulletin there and want to follow along with us. There's three points here. Number one, what John heard. What John heard, really simple outline today. Number two, what John saw. All right, he's talking about our senses, what he heard and what he saw, and then what, number three, what John did. And folks, I am telling you, when you come to face to face with Jesus Christ, your Lord, you're going to have to do something, okay? It may not be obey him, because we do. We, we sometimes just, he's speaking to us and we're not listening. But I'm telling you, when you come into the presence of God, you will have to do something. And I praise God for that. And, and uh, this, this verse and these verses are very, very exciting and uh, I just I, I just look forward to sharing of these with you. You know, John was 90 years old uh, and was the only disciple still alive uh, when he had been banished to the island of Patmos uh, by Emperor Domitian, uh, who was persecuting Christians. And I read uh, part of a history, part of that, and this emperor, this Roman emperor, was one of the most cruel that ever lived and they are saying he could be credited with more than 40,000 deaths. He put more than 40,000 Christians to, to die during that time. And so I hope we understand the scope of what is going on at this time. Uh, the persecution was harsh. The persecution was high. Uh, you, you literally, if you publicly uh, professed Christ, uh, could uh, lose your life. And the discouraged Christians in Asia were those uh, were uh, who the book of Revelation was addressed to. They really needed encouragement uh, since Jerusalem had been destroyed and Israel ravaged. The whole picture looked very bleak. That is why John's first vision, which was given by the Holy Spirit, is of Jesus Christ's presence in the ministry of the church. Matter of fact, if you'll read through here, uh, 12 times, uh, he is told to write something down during the book of Revelation. John's readers took great comfort knowing that Jesus will one day return in glory and defeat his enemies. The descriptions of these huge events take up most of the book of Revelation. In spite of all the disappointments, the Lord has not abandoned Israel or his church. Matter of fact, folks, he is protecting Israel and we as a country, we better be on the side of Israel, all right? That's very, very important. This powerful vision of Jesus Christ must have provided great hope and comfort to the suffering churches John wrote to. The thought of Jesus' ministry during extremely difficult times assured suffering Christians that God and Jesus are the ones in control of our end times. And we are looking at Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. What John heard. I, John, and it's kind of amazing, I don't know if you've caught this already, John identified himself by name three times in the first nine verses. Uh, he obviously wanted everybody to know uh, who he was and what he was about. Uh, he was very, very close to Jesus. He was one of the inner three, as we know, and uh, he... He just had that special connection with Jesus. Both I, John, both brother and companion in the tribulation. That tribulation was the persecution. And John was being persecuted. Okay, he was exiled. He was under house arrest. And you have to remember what I said last week. The island of Patmos, there wasn't a lot of vegetation on that. It was, it, it was just not a good place to be. In the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony 
of Jesus Christ. Two reasons he lists here why John was on the island there. Number one, for the Word of God. John preached the Word of God. He was uh, by, you know, he was a pastor of the church of Ephesus. And we'll be talking about the seven churches here in just a second, in, in just a minute. And he was the leader of that church, and uh, he kind of, uh, you know, just took over uh, as that leader and, and uh, ministered to people and mentored people uh, there. And it says, for the preaching of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He not only preached the Word, he witnessed the Word. And I say witnessed twofold. He was with Christ, okay? He was with Christ personally. And the other thing is, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And I'm telling you, he would not back down. It did not matter if he was threatened. He would preach the Word. And folks, we need biblical preachers in our days and time that will simply preach the Word of God. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit. Folks, it's so important when we come to church to be in the Spirit. If you are born again, you have the Spirit of God in you. But I'm telling you, that manifestation of the Spirit is not always in us. It doesn't leave us. But there are times that we are, we are more and we are closer to Christ than other times. And I want to admonish you through this study to prepare your hearts and your minds for worship. To be in the Spirit. Don't bring stuff from home. Don't be thinking about what's coming on this afternoon. Come to church to worship God in the Spirit. On the Lord's Day. Isn't that neat? The Lord's Day, and we know since Jesus arose on a Sunday, the, the Jewish Sabbath was a Saturday. But we celebrate Sunday. Today is the Lord's Day. And what was John doing? Exiled on an island and what was he doing? He was worshiping God. Folks, we can worship God any day of the week. But there's something special about being with others on the Lord's day, in the Spirit, singing hymns to God, worshiping God, praising God, focusing on God's Word. So John was having a time of worship, and I think it's interesting that Christ chose to do that and speak to John and have the vision on the Lord's day. And I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Folks, in those days, when the trumpet sounds, it meant there was an announcement coming. An announcement coming. So this sound got John's attention, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. We, we talked about that in verse 8, so I won't go back over that. But folks, he, Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus always was. Nobody created God. Nobody created Jesus. All right? He is the Alpha. And that's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. He's the Omega, the end of the alphabet. He is all-knowing. Folks, he is God, Jehovah God of this Bible. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. So Jesus gives John his first assignment. And he's saying, what I show you. And I know some people have a problem with visions, but I'm telling you, you look at the Old Testament and there were pro prophets that had visions. Again, uh, don't mistake a vision for a dream. You have to be careful about dreams versus visions. But I'm telling you, when you have a vision, when God speaks to you, when you know this is from God, you will know it. And John knew without a doubt, with the announcement, with the trumpet, with this, it was from God. So he was told to write in a book, and send it to the seven churches. And what he would normally do is one writer would write one copy of that. And then many times they would hire other writers 
to write, to, to have one copy, and then they would make two copies. And then they would, the next one, there would be four copies. And he said, send these to the churches. And then he lists the churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to uh, Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And these are the seven churches. And if you would look at Ephesus, and, and again, we, I won't spend much time in it, but you would see Ephesus, and he, he would make a clockwise. If the, he was going to go to these churches, he would start at Ephesus, and if you look in the Bible and look on a map, he would just make a circle and come back to Ephesus there. And some people wondered, well, why these seven churches? Because there were more than seven churches in that day and age. But one of the writers said that one of the things was because there were a post office at those, you know, at those towns. So even in the writing and in communication, that could happen also. People much smarter than me uh, also uh, compares these seven churches to our church history in time. And I just want to read these to you. If you're a historian and you like the details of the Word of God, I want you to see what uh, these guys came up with. The first church is Ephesus, and they called it the Apostolic Church. And that was from AD 30 to 100. And this was the first century church. And it was called the Apostolic Church because of the apostles and because the explosion uh, after Jesus arose and 3,000 people got saved. Smyrna was the persecuted church. And this was from A.D. 100 to 312. And, of course, it was the Romans uh, that, that persecuted the church. Pergamum was the indulged church from A.D. 312 to 606. And they had gotten away from the Word of God. They had gotten in the world, and they were identified as the indulged church. Thyatira was the pagan church. And again, there's a difference in indulgement and pagan. Pagan means, hey, it's my life, I do, I do, I'll do what I want, and I don't really care what you think, okay? And folks, we should never have that attitude. That was A.D. 606 to 1520. Sardis was the dead church. Man, I do not want to be identified as the dead church, folks. I mean, the Spirit of God was not in it. A.D. 1520 to 1750, Philadelphia was the church uh, uh, by Christ, the, excuse me, the church Christ loved, okay? Philadelphia uh, literally means love. 1750 to 1900, and Laodicea is the lukewarm church, and this is A.D. 1900 to present. And folks, it's sad that we live in the time of the lukewarm church. Folks, I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be on fire for God. I want people to know that I'm a Christian. I want to make a difference in people's lives. I want to be that light that God tells us that we should be. So we see historically these churches. And, and uh, really what the whole part of this first part was, when the trumpet sounded, it got John's attention and the presence of Jesus was there. Hold your finger there and go with me to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. And if you look at Exodus 19, uh, God was giving instructions to Israel at Mount Sinai. He was about to give the Ten Commandments. And go down in verse 16 with me. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and thick clouds on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. They trembled. Why? Because of the presence of God. Folks, when we come to face to face with God, here's what happens, especially when I know it's God. I'm telling you, I just, I just get quiet. I just get reverent, okay? And it says, and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was uh, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke. 
because the Lord descended upon it by fire. And remember as they left and they were leaving, uh, you know, Egypt, it was fire by day, and it, it was clouds by day, excuse me, and fire by night, showing the presence of God. And smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Notice the words, these descriptions of being in the presence of God, quaking, loud sounds, completely in smoke, trembled. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said, Go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. So God told him, hey, listen, you know, there's, there's that you know, respect, there's that awe of God that we need in our lives. Also let the priests who come near consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to the Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. What is he saying? He's simply saying, I am the God of the Old Testament. I am the God of Jacob and Isaac. I speak to my people as early as Exodus. As he's talking to his people. And folks, we need to listen when God speaks to us. We talk way too much. We think way too much. Part of prayer is not just verbalizing things. It's at the end listening for the voice of God. And so we see God in the Old Testament. We see Jesus in the New Testament, that is who was speaking to John. That's who John gave, or Jesus gave John the vision of. So he says, write this down, and John, I'm sure, began to write. So we see what John had heard. Now let's uh, see what John saw. Look in verse 12. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. So he said at first he didn't see him. He only heard him. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. The first thing John saw was the seven golden lampstands. And these represent the seven churches. And if you look on the front of your bulletin, this is a picture of that, okay? Jesus is among the seven churches. Folks, I'm telling you, if Jesus is in our church, we're wasting our time. We need Jesus in all of our churches. And so Jesus is in the midst of these churches, all right? So he is saying that, and that is so important. Then he gives the descriptions of Jesus. This is the glorified Christ. This is the reigning Christ. This is the Christ that is in heaven at the right hand of God as we speak. And by the way, what are lampstands for? They're for light, folks. I love behind us. You, you, I'm just telling you, one of my favorite things to do is when I'm up here at night, come in that back door when no lights are on and that light just comes glaring down like that. Folks, we, the people of God, are supposed to be the lighthouse. That's what he is speaking of. These seven churches are God's spokespeople here on earth. And in the midst of the seven lampstand, one like, notice the capital S, capital M, folks, that is Jesus Christ himself. Oh man, everything we do is about Jesus. Everything that we are is about Jesus. Every power that we have, that Holy Spirit power, is about Jesus. And we need Jesus in our churches, and we need Jesus in our lives. 
And you're going to see this when we get to the seven churches, folks. Jesus is in the church, but he also need to, needs to be in our personal lives. It applies to both things. And then it gives a description, clothed with garment down to his feet. A garment was a long robe, and it reminds me of the priestly robes that they wore in the Old Testament. So Jesus had these priestly robes on, and in Hebrews, he is described as our high priest, and girded about with chest with a golden band, and it was a sash that would go all across the front of him. And that was a sign of a power, and that was a sign of authority. It was a sign of royalty. I tell you what, folks, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. His head were hair like wool. And again, uh, you know, there's basically three kinds of hair. There is no hair. There is regular hair, <laughs> colored hair. And by the way, I do not color my hair. I, I don't know why some people insist that I do that. But talk to God, talk to my wife. And there is white hair. And folks, white hair is also seen as wisdom in the Old Testament, or in, in Proverbs. Wisdom. So his hair was white. And, and when you think of white, look at the description here. In, his hair was like wool, white as snow. What do you think of? When you think of white, you think of purity. I cannot go away from a wedding and what are the, what are the brides in? They have a white they have a white flowing dress on. And it shows of the purity of them. And folks, God is righteousness. In the Old Testament, he was called the Ancient of Days. His eyes were like flames of fire. Folks, God, Jesus sees everything. Okay? It penetrates our hearts. His look, he, you know, he, he sees everything. He knows everything. There is, there is nothing that he does not know. He really doesn't. And so his eyes were flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass. And when we think of brass, uh, we think of, of, of something that is hard, something uh, that is made of metal. And, and again, he's going to stomp out Satan, all right, which speaks of judgment. He is coming in judgment. Folks, we're all going to be judged. I hope you understand. You are not the exception to the rule. You're going to stand before God. You're going to give an account of your life to God as if it was refined in a furnace, which shows even the purity, uh, you know, like you're the refining of gold. His voice was the sound of many waters. Man, his voice was booming. His voice and when I think of many waters, I think of Niagara Falls. I'm telling you, it is loud there. Okay, it is loud. Uh, it, it is instructive. Uh, we need to listen to the voice of Jesus. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of seven stars, uh, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun. The seven stars there, and he'll explain this in verse 20, but basically the seven stars were angels, and angels are messengers. Folks, I believe churches have guardian angels. I believe we have guardian angels. And there's some who interpret this also as pastor leaders. Okay, you, you choose which one you want to do. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of leaning more towards the guardian angels, but folks, uh, you know, even as pastors, uh, we are the overseers of the church. And out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword. And Hebrews describes, uh, Hebrews 4.12, what is he talking about? When he speaks, people will listen. When he commands, it will be sharp. There's, you're not going to sit around and say, I wonder what he said. You're going to know what he said, folks, with his voice. Folks, I cannot tell you how important the voice of God is, the voice of Jesus. It is so important. And the, the last thing, his countenance was shining like the sun. Oh, folks, 
We couldn't in human form be in the presence of God and Jesus because He was shining so bright. When I think of an example in the New Testament, I believe on the Mount of Transfiguration, all right, John and uh, Peter and James got to see that. And when He comes, folks, I'm telling you, He'll split open the eastern sky and it will be a bright light, a trumpet will sound, and it will be an exciting, exciting thing. Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Go with me. Colossians 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Who is Jesus? God in human flesh. The invisible God. You say, well, I've, I've never seen God Hey, I haven't seen him personally either. But I know he's alive. I know he's real. I know when he speaks to me. I know our God of this Bible. The firstborn of all creation. And again, it speaks of him being in creation in John 1.1. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Folks, nothing is stronger than God in Jesus. There's no power on earth. I don't care what country it is. I don't care how much nuclear power you have. Folks, everything, God and Jesus are in control of everything. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him all things consist. He is the one that's making it go. You know, we're we're spinning around. The earth spins around and we're going around in orbit. And you'd think we'd feel that. Folks, hey, it's God. He, He keeps everything in place. Now here it is. He is the head of the body of the church. Hey, folks, I'm just the messenger boy, okay? I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. Jesus Christ is head of the church. Why? Because he gave his life for the church. He spent his life. He died a cruel death. He rose again for the bride of Christ, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Let me tell you what preeminence preeminence means. It means absolute, supreme authority. Folks, there is no other than Jesus Christ. Oh, I know when he came and he died on a cross, Satan thought he defeated Jesus Christ. But he didn't, folks. He arose. We are just less than a month from celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he not only arose, He is a living, He is alive, and He is preeminent in our lives. He is uno number one. So we need Jesus. He heard Jesus. He saw Jesus. And then look what He did. Look at verse 17. And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. And when I see the word dead here, You know, there's a couple of things that come to my mind. One, if someone's dead, I I would think you would use the word, like we would use the word passed out, okay? It was almost like a shock, okay? Just paralyzed type deal. Or not only, you know, when you think about dead, it can also mean as far as what's going on in your life that that you were just, you were just, you know, thinking and and you were you you just couldn't pro- let me say it you couldn't process what was going on okay it would just be one of those things cuz first he heard him and then when he actually turned around and saw him i am telling you he fell down now i think there's two reasons he fell down one was to worship folks when we come up to heaven and we see jesus christ for the first time i believe with all my heart we're going to fall on our face and we're going to worship god And it says, as dead there. And when we think about that, it simply means 
we, we have trouble being in the literal presence of God. John, in this vision, literally saw him. And it was almost a shock to his body. Okay? And then it says, next, it says, do, he, excuse me, it says, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, and why do you lay your hand on somebody? Okay, just to give them that calm assurance. Okay, Jesus touched John. Do not be afraid. Now, folks, we as Christians should not be afraid. We should not be afraid of anything. Man, Jesus is in the midst of the churches. Jesus is in our lives. How many times in Jesus' ministry did he tell the disciples not to be afraid? We have no fear of the end times. We have no fear of what is to come. Why? Because Jesus controls it all. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. As far as I know, this is the only book in the Bible where the outline of the book is found in the first chapter of the book. And I believe this is what he is speaking of in verse 18. I am he who lives. Chapter 1 covers that. This is Jesus giving that vision and telling John to write that down. And Jesus comes to him in first person and tells him to write that down. I am he who lived. I was dead. I was dead. And he was speaking uh, you know, of chapters 2 and 3. If you will see one of the titles of one of the churches that, we'll, that we will we'll, uh, speak about in the next uh, seven weeks is the dead church. Okay? I was dead. And again, I understand it's talking about his life also. His life also. But it's, it's talking about the outline. And then it says, and I am alive forevermore. From chapter 4 to chapter 22 speaks of how this world is going to end. And folks, Jesus is going to be uh, everything during that time. And we are going to study that during that time. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So you, you remember and you think about what Jesus just said. I am the God of the past. I am God of the present. I am the God of the future. It's all in my control. Then he gives them the calm assurance of the keys. What do you have keys for? Keys are, are, are right. You know, they, they open things. They control who comes in and out of things. So he has the keys. And notice what he says of Hades. And folks, Hades is not hell. People get that, those two confused. Okay, Hades was the holding place before the cross. And you go to Luke chapter 16, and, and uh, you know, he, he is speaking in that, that two place. There's the place where Christians go, and those Old Testament saints that by faith believed in Christ, and then there's where that rich young ruler, and, and he went, and it was the holding place there. All right? So what did he do? And again, you have to study this. I'm not, and, and it's, you know, some people agree with this and other people don't agree with this. But I believe during that three days after uh, he, he died, he went and unlocked the gates of Hades and let the Christians out and led a procession up to heaven where they are even as we speak because uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he's, he sent the others to the place called hell, waiting their final judgment. So what is he saying? Don't be afraid. I'm controlling it. Okay, I've got this. And then look at the last part, end of death. Don't be afraid of dying, folks. It's graduation day. It's graduation day. I'm telling you, it is freedom from your body, freedom from sin, freedom from temptation, to eternal bliss and living with Jesus Christ forever 
and ever. My friend, there is victory in Jesus. Do not be afraid. Then he says, write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. What is the things we have seen? We just saw the first vision of John. What are our, what are, what are the the things? These are the seven churches. It is talking about our individual, personal relationship with Jesus Christ and our roles in the church. And things to take place, folks, it's prophecy. Man, don't be afraid of revelation. Don't be afraid of prophecy. Folks, he's coming back. And we win. We win. Verse 20. And that's something about, it says the mystery, in, in Revelation. Sometimes he, he makes it obvious, these interpretations and these symbols. And other times you have to dig, you have to go back to the Old Testament in those books that we spoke about. But the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. John chapter 11, go with me. And I close with this. John 11, and we know the story of the death of Lazarus. Jesus knew what he was doing. Disciples said, you know, they were wanting to go. Mary and Martha wanted to go. Mary and Martha couldn't figure out why he wasn't here. He was a close friend of Jesus. Jesus had stayed in his house, and Lazarus died. Look at verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. I call that sitting with an attitude. Now Martha said, Jesus Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see this bold statement? I've thought about this a lot. You're accusing Jesus Christ. Okay, it's your fault. I don't have a brother now. Okay, that's a possibility. But even now, I know what, that whatever you ask of God, he will give you. She, re- she redeemed herself. I'm not too hard on her. But I, I don't know. That, that just hits me wrong when I read that. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Martha heard the lesson. Martha knew that he was the resurrection and the life. I mean, she knew that. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Oh, folks, salvation is only in Jesus Christ. You can't work your way in. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't sing enough specials. You can't teach enough classes to get into heaven. You come through, the, uh, through Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ or you're not coming at all. And folks, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying to John, hey John, man, I got this. <laughs> I got it. He saw John. I mean, John saw him for who he truly is. Oh, folks, he is the resurrection and the life. And it says, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I understand death and I understand all that. But folks, we're not dying. I mean, our body dies, man, but our spirit, it is more alive than it's ever been in our lives at the point of death. Matter of fact, when I die, (laughs) I've said this before, I hope for some reason I have this smile on my face. And when they're embalming me thinking, why has he got that smile? Let's try to get that off him. Why? Folks, we're going to a better place. We serve a risen Savior. 
We have Jesus Christ in our lives. We have eternal life. We have a perfect place. We get to see Jesus himself. We get to talk to Jesus himself. We get to be in the presence of God. Quit your stinking whining. Live for Jesus. Live. And she said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who come into the world. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you have that assurance that when you die, you'll go to heaven? Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are right with God today? That if He were to come today, you are right with Him. Oh, folks, Jesus Christ is everything to me. Jesus Christ is everything to the church. We need Jesus. Father, thank You for the day. God, thank You for Scripture. Thank you that, and, and, and God, I, I know people are going through things. I know it's hard. But God, when I think about what's waiting for us, God, I can only shout, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All this is going to be gone. We're not going to remember it. I don't believe we're going to ask God questions or ask Jesus questions. I think we're going to be like John. I think we're going to, just fall at the feet of Jesus and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh God, if there's one here that doesn't know you today, God, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would just speak to their heart and that they would come and give their heart and their life to Christ. God, I pray for Christians. God, I know there was a lukewarm church. There was a dead church. There was these lifeless churches. And God, I pray that we won't settle for that. I pray that you'll renew that spirit in our lives. And I pray that even in the place, maybe they need to come to the altar, but maybe just in the place, they've made a recommitment of their life to Christ. God, there's, there's not much time left. God, I pray that we would witness and we would tell others about Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. If, if God has spoken to you in any way, as you stand to your feet, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.